All right, we're gonna do this again. Uh, we, we filmed it, but it only filmed 10 minutes, so... Uh, hi! <laughs> I recently hit 3,000 subscribers. I'm Yay. now on 3,150-something, I believe. The actual number will be showing up on screen now. But, because I hit that number, I'm doing a Q&A video. So I will be aing your cues, the cues that have been sent to me. And joining me is my beautiful wife, Red, who will be reading out the cues for me to a. Shall we? Okay. Willow Tree on YouTube asks, when slash how did you first get into mythology and folklore? Right. Okay. So odd. Um, I didn't actually hit Irish folklore and mythology first, nor was it Greek mythology or Norse mythology, as happens with many people in Ireland anyway, because a certain someone taught us to be ashamed of our culture. I actually hit Black American folklore first, because <coughs> my parents had gotten a cassette tape of Br'er Rabbit stories when I was very small, and they played it often because I needed constant sound and stuff for to be able to sleep and to stop screaming constantly. Um, so yeah, Br'er Rabbit was my introduction to the world of, of folklore and legend and that kind of thing. The second part of the question is, do you have a favorite story or favorite figure that appears in folklore? I do not have a favorite story. Because that is like choosing a favourite child. My favourite figure? Not really. Not really. There's too many. There's, there's so many. There's so many. And the thing is, when you really look at them, most of them are arseholes. <laughs> K.A. on YouTube asks, Is there a character or story that you heavily relate to? Something that makes you go, Oh shit, it me. Change links. Change links. And, and and I'll be doing a video soon that will explain why, but, but change links. Stop reacting like that as if I didn't do it the last time we filmed this. <laughs> it sucks every time. <laughs> the uh, liberal cook. Hi, Neil. <laughs> what you did. You know what you did. On YouTube asks, what was your gateway to folklore and how can parents learn more to prevent their children from getting hooked on folklore? So I'm gonna make this into Irish folklore specifically. Uh, my proper gateway into Irish folklore, it wasn't um, the Br'er Rabbit tapes, obviously because they're not Irish, and it wasn't um, learning about like Sean McCool or Coquillan or or the children of Lear in their exceptionally sanitized forms that we all get taught in primary school. Uh, it was when I was in university. Uh, I was changing my major for the 70,000th time and I saw some of the modules in Irish folklore, read the titles, the descriptions. It sounded fascinating so I decided yeah I'll, I'll do Irish folklore um that was great the lecturers were very very kind and patient um the class sizes were tiny because nobody wants to major in Irish folklore what the fuck are you gonna do with that um and it cleared a lot of misconceptions I had about the idea of folklore because most people hear that term and they think folk stories and they think they maybe think folk music and and that'll be it but folklore is is far more expansive than that it is the entirety of a culture's knowledge that is transmitted primarily through oral tradition it's it's all of oral tradition and that includes things like like if you have a largely illiterate society the way they teach each other to build houses, the, the, the building of houses, that's part of their oral tradition, therefore part of their folklore. The way they make clothes and tools and toys and all that kind of thing, that's 
part of their folklore, the way they understand weather and that kind of thing. And I don't mean like coming up with stories to explain the weather. I mean like ways of, of predicting the weather that are like at least reasonably accurate, like by the behavior of animals and that kind of thing. That's, that's folklore. Folk medicine is folklore. Uh, actually, here, here, here. Let's talk about it. All right. Characteristics of folklore. It is traditional. It is communal. Belongs to a group of people rather than to an individual. It is stable, following a basic formula. It is variable. The formula varies and changes. It is informally transmitted. And it is anonymous. Unlike a novel, for example, we can't trace the source of folklore. That's what folklore is. That's how expansive it is. Uh, though actually I think the Irish word for it, uh, bailigious, which basically means mouth knowledge, is, is a better term in a way because it's more descriptive. It's, it's more accurate. How can parents learn more to prevent their children from getting <coughs> folklore? Learn less. Learn less is what you do. Um, you stick with the ideas that most people already have. Um, you stick with the ideas that were entirely fabricated and spread around by the Brothers Grimm. Um, Who are assholes, by the way. They, they were terrible. Going into the Brothers Grimm for a moment, they created an awful lot of ideas that they implanted into the stories they collected. Like the wicked stepmother trope. That's something they basically invented. And it was because they wanted to instill respect for the biological family so they couldn't have the mother doing all these horrible things. It had to be a stepmother, someone coming into the family. And other things like the idea that all of these folk tales have morals and lessons. Mostly they didn't. The Brothers Grimm inserted morals and lessons into every story because their books weren't primarily about preserving folk tales. They were about instilling proper Germanic behavior in people uh, or what they saw as proper Germanic behavior. The works of the Brothers Grimm, it's, it's largely propaganda. And frankly, the fact that so much of, of media analysis, the, the ideas of folklore in media analysis are shaped by studies of the Brothers Grimm is absolutely terrifying. That's not a representation of what European culture is like and values. It's a representation of what these two proto-fascists liked and valued. That's why the Hitler youth loved them so much. The Brothers Grimm, like most other folklore collectors of their period, were romantic nationalists. And romantic nationalism is the form of nationalism, the specific form of nationalism that birthed fascism. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, if you, if, you, if you don't want your children to get properly into folklore and actually develop an, an understanding of what folklore is and, 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 and you, you don't want them to, to, to really learn about culture, get them into the Brothers Grimm and just accept all of the, the, the baseline media, like shit tier media analysis. I'm, Joseph Campbell! I want to dig up his corpse and fire it into the sun. It's literally on his Wikipedia page that most folklorists hate him. Okay, next question. <laughs> Aragorn on YouTube asks, which creature from Irish folklore is your favorite and why? It is the Dubberku. And the reason why, I'll explain what the Dubberku is first for the uninitiated. It's a giant murderous otter. Most commonly seen on the west coast of Ireland. The most recent sighting was 2003. And it, um, it's got this kind of whistling howl. Uh, this is the journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland. This is the December 1948 issue. Uh, which I just randomly found in a book market one day. Uh, there are several graves, uh, or there have been several gravestones in Ireland of people who had been killed by a Dovercoo, and they usually would have had a carving of a Dovercoo on them. 
Uh, a lot, most of them have been lost, uh, destroyed, or that kind of thing. But, but, in here we have a picture of the gravestone of Gronia Nihunli. And here you can see the carving of the Dovarku. Its head is pulled back onto its back, and you can see a hand here stabbing it in the chest. Uh, the story of Gronia Nihunli is one that can be found in the Dukas archive. Uh, it's one I'm very familiar with, it's one I tell frequently at work um, and just for fun because it's a good story. Uh, but the reason why I love the Dovarku so much is because it's very, very plausible. There is a species of otter in South America, the giant river otter, that is roughly the size of the Dovarku, which is... I'll put it this way, the, the giant river otter is known to eat crocodiles on occasion and is about the size of a crocodile. Um, and it has the same kind of whistling howl. So to me, it seems reasonably plausible that on occasion maybe one of those got battered across the ocean somehow and just washed up in Ireland and then killed someone. Uh, it's, it's an actual animal. It fits the description. It seems plausible to me. And that makes it really interesting to me. Okay. Nicole Agent on YouTube asks, Do you have an academic white whale? A bit of folklore you want to know more about or want to figure out and just can't find enough info. Michael Roberts. Uh, Michael Roberts is, is a figure that I have found three entries on in the Dukas archive in the school's collection. Um, completely by accident I found the first one and then fell down a rabbit hole looking for the others. Uh, Michael Roberts is variously described as either a necromancer or a magician and seems to have been centered around the Midlands. The entries I found are from three different towns and at least two different counties. I can't remember off the top of my head. He's interesting to me because the stories about him are very consistent with each other, despite the fact that they're from different areas. And when stories in folklore have a high level of consistency with each other, that's usually indicative that the figure or the creature in question was actually uh, quite important or, or represented a, a, a larger body of lore. So I'd be fascinated to see if there are more stories, like maybe there are some in the manuscript collection that just haven't been digitized yet, or maybe there's still stories being told today. Uh, I've, been, I've been wanting to do some collection work on that just to, just to find out. I've spoken with the, the Folklore Archive about how I might go about doing that. I think I'm going to reach out to Michael Fortune who is an active folklore collector in Ireland at the moment. Um, talk about some of his methodology, ask if he's heard anything, and maybe try to build myself a methodology out of there. The consistent things about him are an involvement with shapeshifting. There's one story where he turns a pair of boulders into pigs, and after someone pulls his legs off, he just pops them back on. And... Um, there's another story where he turns a, a handkerchief into a hair and a couple more where he animates things like a broom or a shovel or that kind of thing. Basically fucking the Sorcerer's Apprentice in Fantasia. But what's really, really interesting to me about him is that is the idea of where he learned his magic because there's two ideas on that one is that he learned it from a book that he got from the devil which is a fairly standard idea in in irish folklore when you're talking about magicians everybody gets those books it's not special the other is that he learned it from his uncle that he lives with 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 his parents as well 
But other than having a big, big, black, bushy beard, nobody knows what his uncle looks like. Because his uncle just sits at the kitchen table like this all the time. And that's creepy as fuck. That's wonderful. Yeah. I love that. So I, I want to learn more about this sticker. It's a horror series waiting to happen. <laughs> Trans and Gothic Piano on YouTube asks, I don't know where to ask this, but what's the difference between a leprechaun and a fairy? Right, so leprechauns are a subset of fairies. They're a kind of fairy. Uh, there are d differences still, like... Leprechauns are consistently described as being very small. Always. There's no deviation on that. Whereas in the Irish tradition, fairies usually aren't. Uh, I think... And I think the times where Irish fairies are described as being very small... I think that's the influence of European mythology and folklore creeping in. And, and just kind of altering things slightly. Which... It's still part of our folklore that they would be, but it's it's not a very consistent part. Um, leprechauns in particular have their love of gold, obviously, and they work as shoemakers. They tend to be much more solitary than other fairies. Other fairies, they're always playing sports together and, and going on hunts and rides together and they live in big halls together, whereas... Leprechauns tend to be very solitary, they live off by themselves, they don't really socialise very much. And leprechauns more often live in the human world rather than in the other world. They, they'll live in like uh, an empty tree trunk or in a cave or something like that or out in the bogs. Whereas the fairies they live, they might enter the other world through... A lake or a river or the sea or a cave, but that's just an entryway into their world, which is kind of separate but kind of not. Katya Bastrup on YouTube asks, how far, how far back in time have you been able to track creatures in Irish folklore? Right, so... The furthest back we can really trace any of them would be the around about the 8th century, maybe the 7th or 6th at a push. But the reason for this is obviously that the written tradition, that's, that's how far back we have written traditions. Uh, these mostly would have been composed by the church and we'd have evidence for say the Tua de Danon, the Fir Bullug, the Fermorians. Uh, we'd have evidence for leprechauns, that mostly the Book of Invasions, but also the story of King Fergus MacLady. That's where we'd get leprechauns. Um, let's see, anything else? There, there's entries on the weird battle zombies the Tua de Danon made when they were off fighting Syrians in Greece before coming to Ireland. Um, that's... That would be from the, the 1600s. That was Geoffrey Keating. So, yeah, quite a while ago. The oral tradition probably goes back further than that. But one of the ways in which the oral tradition is definitely less reliable than the written tradition is that you can't date the oral tradition. It's, it's useless. You can't figure out how long ago something was by that. I am going to go on a bit of a rant, though, about how the oral tradition gets devalued in favour of the written tradition and why that's a load of bollocks. Um, the written tradition, especially back then, what you have to understand about it is that not only was writing somewhat inaccessible because of levels of education, but also because the materials for writing things down were very expensive. So if someone was writing something down, especially something like mythology, if was being paid for by someone. Now, in the case of Irish mythology, that mostly would have been the church. And so the version of Irish mythology we have is very much Christianized. And the same thing happened with the Norse Eddas. That was mostly written down by the church, or translated by the church, or both. 
But there's other examples of that as well. Uh, if you read the Tawn, which is Ireland's great epic, it centres around Cuchulain and the battle with Queen Maeve. Uh, Croher MacNessa is terrible. He's awful. He, he, he... <laughs> Worst person ever. Croher MacNessa. Um, now, some people have suggested that this might be the result of people basing their versions of the Tawn on one commissioned by the Uniel families. Uh, the Uniels, they were rivals with the Ulla, who were another royal family of Ulster, and they claimed to be descended from Croher MacNessa. And so the idea is that the O'Neills would have paid for the for the original version of the Tawn where Croher's an asshole uh, to delegitimize the Ulla. And that kind of thing, it would have happened an awful lot in terms of writing down mythology all over the world for centuries. Because different myths, they're, they're political, they're, they're tied to city-states or to family dynasties and that kind of thing. And so if someone's paying for it, it's usually either someone from the dynasty or the city-state or whatever to, to legitimize them and to make them look good and to be propaganda in favor of them, or it's by their rival as propaganda against them. Like you see people saying that you can't compare modern superhero stories to ancient mythology because modern superhero stories are military propaganda. But so were they. So were ancient myths. But the ones that were written down, they were written down to be propaganda. Deliberately, with a deliberate agenda. Uh, the thing about... The difference with the oral tradition, though, is that the bias is less focused. There is still bias there, but it's more the bias of a culture. It's more the bias of the national attitudes to certain ideas. Um, and so it's, it's more indicative of how that culture viewed things, and it's more indicative of, of how that culture has developed, whereas the written tradition is indicative of very specific people's biases, the, the biases of the, the people who paid for it. So yeah, that, that's why I think oral tradition is sometimes just a little bit more reliable. Tyus Wajadi? Do Doing this again. I think it's Chias Wajati, but I don't know. Feel free to correct us, as in please do correct us. And apologies again. Um, this person on YouTube asks, Hi there, I wonder, is there any specific song that becomes favorite to the fairy? Or is there any restricted song that the fairy hates? And I'm just going to say again, Fairy's gonna fuck with Hosier. I don't, I, I don't care what anybody says. So I can't think of specific ones off the top of my head right now. Um, what I will say though is fairies, they absolutely hate it when you play their music. They are big on their intellectual property rights, which is not surprising seeing as the very first copyright dispute in recorded history was in Ireland um, and was literally a battle fought over a copy of a book. Um, <laughs> I'm serious, what that's facts. true. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, like the, the fairies, they don't like it when humans play their music. Even when the fairies have specifically taught a human one of their tunes, there's usually a condition that they can only play it publicly three times and then if they play it any further than that, the fairies will fucking come for them. Um, there is one story, uh, in the, I think it's in the archive, of, about a fiddler, a very well-known fiddler, a historical fiddler that definitely existed, who said he got one of his tunes from a leprechaun who he had caught stealing food from his pantry. Um, <laughs> and there, there's sheet music of that tune. I have some, I have a copy of the sheet music in my notes downstairs um I, I might learn to play it at some point there probably is specific tunes i do think there probably is 
I'll, I'll co I've been wanting to do a specific video on, on folk music at some point anyway, so we'll, we'll, we'll tackle that then. Mester's Pets on TikTok says, congrats, what's your favorite underappreciated folklore being? Hello, this is this is one of my mutuals on TikTok who is a colleague in folklore. She's a, she does work on on Swedish folklore and on textiles. But um, I think I've already answered that with the Dover coup. So yes, let's let's move on. Okay. Um, last question is, it's Don Six L. So I'm assuming Donald. 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 On TikTok says two questions. First question is, what storyteller or alive, alive or dead do you take the most inspiration from? All right. Um, this is gonna sound like paid promotion, which it's not. Um, it's also gonna sound a little schmaltzy, which it is. But my my colleagues at the National Leprechaun Museum, and at Unlicensed Oral Arts. Um, we're all professional storytellers, but we're unusual in that what we used to do at the Leprechaun Museum before the plague hit was we'd be telling, each of us would be telling stories five times a day, three to four days a week, every week of the year. The only day we'd normally close would be Christmas Day. So... Most storytellers don't get to practice live performance that much. They don't get that kind of rate, that kind of turnover of audience. It's like the stamina that requires is incredible. Um, but also the, just the, the level of knowledge and, and understanding of folklore. And the, 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 also just the, the, the level of looking out for each other, it's, it's, it's really good. And I, I just really like my colleagues. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Of all the eye patches you've made, do you have a fave? That's hard to say because they're all really cool. There's um, so many of them. They're all over the house. They're li there's like 10. Um, this is really cool. This is the one I made for when I'm finally doing Darkland solo tours. Obviously, it looks a bit Frankensteinian. The, the coin in the middle here is uh, the souvenir coin we sell for Darkland at the museum. Um, I have kind of a connection to it because I, I, I really love Frankenstein. It's, it's one of my favorite books. And I identify with the creature an awful lot. But also, there is my peacock patch, which I'm really proud of. It took me four attempts to get a feather to stay on there properly. Um, there's my fish skin patch. That is salmon leather dyed turquoise. I just think it's really pretty. There's this one which needs a new strap. Um, I wasn't sure I could pull off attaching tree bark to the front of an eye patch, but I did and it doesn't look like shit, so I'm really proud of it. Um, this was the first eye patch I made. Uh, and it is the most comfortable. I have not been able to replicate that level of comfort in any of the others. Be you'd think the more often I do this, the better I get at it, but no, dyspraxia. And, and okay, I'm just going to put this one on. Not technically an eye patch. These are the safety goggles that I wear when I'm using power tools out in the workshop. And because obviously it's safer to use those if I can see clearly, I put this bronze disc in there. I think it looks dwarven as fuck. I think I look like a steampunk dwarf. I think that's very cool. Also, my bad eye is ultra protected. Ultra protected. And I think we're done. Yep, that's all of them. We're done. And the battery is about to die if it hasn't already. <laughs> you can tell we're in the final sprint with that one. <laughs> Thanks, bitches.